May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we celebrate Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the disciples of Jesus, which marked the birth of the church. We also celebrate the baptism of Abigail and thanksgiving for the baptism of Sophia, two of our youngest members of St. Mary's, but just as precious and important as our oldest members. We heard in the reading from Acts, 10 days after the resurrection of Jesus, about Pentecost. That when the disciples were all together in a room, they suddenly experienced the rush of a violent wind. A wind that filled the whole house and tongues of fire rested on them as they were filled with the Holy Spirit. As most of you probably will know, the Holy Spirit is one of three persons of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The words Father and Son we can probably easily relate to from our own experience of fatherhood and son or daughtership. However, the Holy Spirit might be a different story. How do you describe the Holy Spirit? What image reveals something essential about the Spirit? The Bible uses a variety of images to describe the experience of the Holy Spirit and uses words like wind, breath, fire, power, whisper. The early Christians often talked about the Spirit in connection with the way Jesus was present to them, working among them. Their Greek word for spirit actually meant the wind or airflow but also breath, the faint air current that shows that you are alive. What do we think of when we talk about wind as image of the Holy Spirit? When the wind picks up into a storm, it can break off large trees like matches. It is a great power, but you cannot see the power itself. Therefore, it is a sign of the mysterious action of God. You can see the effect of God's presence, but you do not see him self. Equally wonderful is the image of breath. In ancient Israel, they spoke of the breath of life. God breathed his own breath of life into man. The spirit is life, and brings life. In our reading from Acts, we heard the effect that the Holy Spirit had on the apostles. The Spirit transformed them. After all, after the resurrection, the apostles were frightened and confused, but the Holy Spirit became their strength in their weakness. The Spirit made them speak about God's deeds of power to Jews from all kinds of different backgrounds. Everyone could understand what they were saying, regardless of their native tongue. That same spirit that empowered the early church is there for believers today, for you and me. The Holy Spirit continues to inspire guide and empower us in our daily lives and in our walk with God. The church and its context, the society we live in, may have changed, but it's still the same spirit that works through all the ages. And this spirit works in people of all ages, in all generations. The Apostle Peter uses words from the prophet Joel. 
I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. One of the ways that the spirit keeps the church united is by building bridges between the generations because the Holy Spirit works in both old and young. In our church, we have six or seven generations worshiping together. All are different from each other. And each generation takes on a special meaning because we have experienced special life events and critical transitions at particular moments in history. And these moments have defined our lives. Let me give you an idea of how different the time and context was of our generations in our church. And maybe you recognize yourself in one of the short descriptions. Our oldest generation in the church is the so-called silent generation, born between the 1920s and 1945. This generation experienced the post-war recovery and cultural shifts. Children were expected to earn their way through life using a strong work ethic. And after this generation came the baby boomers, born somewhere between 1945 and 1965, after the Second World War. They're also called the protest generation. Some of this generation actually had quite a wild youth and defied their parents, protested against the Vietnam War and created the Summer of Love, Woodstock. And the Dutch equivalent here in the Kralingse Bos were big events at that time. Then came Generation X, also known as the Lost Generation, my generation. They were born between 1965 and 1980 and are known for their independence and adaptability. This generation lived through the AIDS epidemic and, in Holland, grew up in a time of economic decline. Not Woodstock, but demonstrations against nuclear weapons are typical for this generation. And this lost generation is followed by the millennials, born between 1980 and 1995. They are also referred to as Generation Y. Born in a digital world, they were the first generation to grow up with internet, digital information, and mobile phones. And then we have Generation Z, the people born between 1995 and 2010. The people of this generation are the first digital natives. They were born in a world where they're constantly connected to one another through phones and screens. If this generation had been at Pentecost with the disciples, they would immediately pull out their phones to record the event and share it on social media. And finally, Generation Alpha, born between 2010 and today, the youngest generation still unfolding, who have never known a time when social media, media did not exist. This is the generation of our children and grandchildren, like Abigail and Sophia. All these generations we find here in our church. These young and old grew up in different circumstances, in changing societies and in unique time periods. Nothing is static. They have sometimes different views on life and the church. They have shifting motivations and ideas. So a generation gap sometimes comes to the forefront in misunderstandings, annoyances, and frictions. Different worldviews of the older generations 
the establishment and of the younger generation come together? How can we keep our church relevant and united through the ages? How can we communicate the good news to a new generation? We do that in a language that this younger, younger generation can understand and relate to. Just as with the early church, true unity can only come forth from the working of the Holy Spirit. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit over our church and us individually is as relevant today as it was in the early church. Because the Holy Spirit works in each of us, as we heard Peter say at Pentecost. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. The Holy Spirit helps us to share the good news in word and deed and to have the courage to change and transform if that's needed to serve others to serve the younger generation today we welcome abigail and sophia into our church family at birth life is passed on a great and incomprehensible miracle. At baptism, new life is also passed on, eternal life filled with God's love. The birth of a child is a great miracle and a cause for great joy. Just as we are born into a family and are inseparable from a family, so also, so also through baptism, we are born into the family of God and received into the church. Baptism is not a symbolic act, but a sacrament. It's a sign of a new beginning, a new life in the spirit. It's actually beautiful and fitting that Abigail's baptism and Sophia's Thanksgiving is on this Pentecost Sunday. Because just as the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples at Pentecost, we pray for the same Spirit to guide and protect Sophia and Abigail throughout their life. The Holy Spirit connects us with each other connects and unites each generation in the body of Christ. As a church, we are called to nurture the faith of Sophia and Abigail. We are called to make them feel at home, to abet them in loving kindness. Just as in the early church, we need to share the good news with them in the language they can understand inspired by the Spirit. In the past and today, the Holy Spirit is essential for breathing life and truth into the Church, the body of Christ. He is the breath of God that gave birth to the Church at Pentecost and continues to guide and inspire us in all generations. Amen.